But hey, um, let's pray. Let's pray. I want to. I want to share something this morning. Um, next three to four weeks, I'm going to stick on a theme, and we're going to go on a bit of a journey, hopefully together. Um, what I want to pray this morning is I want you to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. I want you to listen. What is God saying to you? What is it? As I'm speaking, and it'll make more sense as I begin to talk, what is it that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you personally about in your life, your world? At the end of the service, I'm going to ask you to do something. Uh, up the front, I've got notepads here, and we've got some envelopes and some pens and pencils and jazz. And at the end of the service, I'm going to ask you to get up as an act of faith and ask you to grab a piece of paper and get you to write that thing down. And it'll make sense when I talk. I want you to write that thing down. Grab an envelope. I want you to put it in the envelope, seal it. No one's going to see it. Nobody's going to see it. Then I want you to just leave it up on the stage here. I'm going to get a box. I'm going to put it in a box and lock the box. I promise you nobody's going to see whatever you write in that. What I'm also going to promise you is that every day when I come in here to work, I'm going to lay my hands in that box. For the next four weeks, I'm going to pray for whatever's in that box, whatever's going on in your world, I'm going to pray for you. Each of the leaders, every time they come in this building, you're going to walk over here and pray over that box. Everybody that comes in, when the worship band come in on Thursday, first thing you guys are going to do is you're going to lay hands on that box and you're going to pray for the things in that box. Uh, when you come in to clean, whoever's on the cleaning roster, when you, anyone that opens that door, before you do anything in this building, you're going to come up to the box and you're going to pray over that box and all the things that are in that box and the, the prayer requests and the, and, and the stuff that, that people have put there. We're going to pray over it. If you don't come in here for any reason, but you want to come in and pray over that box, get in touch with me. I will come and unlock the door. You can come on in and you can pray over that box. I want to see as much prayer as possible prayed for one another over the things that are going to end up in that box on those bits of paper over the next four weeks. At the end of the four weeks, I'm going to open the box and you can take it back and you can have a look at where you are now from where you were and what you wrote down on that piece of paper. Is that nice and clear? Anybody that wants to come in at any point in the next four weeks, you contact me. We'll open the doors. You can come on in and you can pray uh, over that box. So we're going to bring some things to the Lord. And for the next four weeks, we're going to talk about uh, uh, different aspects of what we're going, to, we're going to talk about and so on. But we're going to have prayer. I want lots and lots of prayer for each other over these things that end up in that box. So before I, I, I share this morning what's on my heart, let me just pray. Father, I thank you again for the opportunity to gather. Lord, we acknowledge in this room right now that there are believers, followers of Jesus all around the world. There are hundreds of thousands of them that would love the freedom to do what we're doing now. They would love to gather in a, in a building in public, to pull up on the side of a road, get out of a car, carry a Bible, whatever. They would love to be in a place like this where we can turn the amps up and blast worship music, knowing that everybody outside can hear it, but have no fear that anything is going to happen. Because we have freedom in this country right now to lift up the name of Jesus, to talk about Jesus. We have freedom to purchase Bibles. We can buy Bibles from secular bookstores these days. We can turn on the radio and we can listen to people from all around the world preaching. We can jump on YouTube. We can watch all kinds of messages. We can go to, go to podcasts on, on, on Spotify. God, we have so much access to so many things and so many people in the world don't have that. And so, Father, I want to end this year by acknowledging that and saying thank you. Thank you for that. And I pray, Holy Spirit, as, as I just shared this morning, I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would speak to people. Whatever that thing is, Lord, as we talk about it, I pray you would make that thing clear to them. And I also know, God, that, as Jackie said, Father, 2024, God, there's nothing magical about the turning of a calendar date, but it creates something. There's something in the air that happens at this time of year where, where God, either people completely give up and go, what is the point? It's going to be the same. Or they rise in a bit of faith and go, no, no, this is a chance for a fresh canvas. Yeah. And Lord, I pray for those people that are thinking, blah, blah, more of the same. I pray for them this morning. I pray, God, stir their spirit up. Put a bit of fight and a bit of faith back in their spirit, Lord, that this year could be the year. If this could be the year where they get across that line, where they hear that word, where they, they understand that question, where they get a bit of insight, Lord, where they get healing, deliverance and breakthrough. This could be the year, Father. And, and, and God, I pray that it would be. And I ask that in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Um, so here we are, last day of the year. Um, 
I didn't plan it this way, by the way. It's just how it happened. It'd be pretty cool to stand up and go, well, I actually planned it that the last day of the year would be a church service. I had nothing to do with it. It's just the way the calendar fell. Blame Jesus, apparently, because the whole calendar's revolving around him. So this is the plan of Jesus, that 2023's last day would be the day that God's people gather together to worship him and to lift up his name. Let me give you a couple of real quick statistics about uh, New Year's resolutions, because that's kind of the theme of today. People are thinking about New Year's resolutions, and you know, when I wake up tomorrow, normally I wake up at 12 o'clock at lunchtime. Tomorrow I'm getting up at 5. It's a new start of a new leaf. I'm getting up at 5, you know? And, and, but, but you don't, or maybe you do for one or two days or so on. Statistically, about 9% of people, 9% of people follow through with what we call New Year's resolutions. About 9% of people make that change, a permanent change in their life. That's 9%. That means that 91% of people don't. In fact, 23% will quit within the first week. 23% of people will quit that New Year's resolution within seven days. It'll be over, almost as quick as it started. And another 43% will be finished by the end of January. So if you put those two together, that's 40, 50, 63, that's 66% of people who make New Year's resolutions will have already failed and let them go within four weeks of tomorrow. And then the rest of them peter out by the end of the third month, statistically. And only 9% of people actually follow them through. See, resolutions are, if we think about a New Year's resolution, resolutions in a nutshell are actually about change, aren't they? They're about change. What changes do I want to make in my world for me? What changes do I want to make in my world, for me. The Greek philosopher Heraclitus from Ephesus, he lived around 500 BC, 500 years before Christ, and he coined this phrase, he said, the only constant in life is change. The only constant in life is change. Who would agree with that? How many of you, if you go back and you look at the beginning of 2023, and now here you are at the last day of 2023, how many of you would say that things have changed in your life? Hands up. Wow, the rest of you are exactly the same. I'll bet you're not. I'll guarantee you're not exactly the same as you were at the start of 2023. Change is a constant process. With every bit of information I gain, I change somehow. Even if it's just I've changed what I know, but I've changed something. I've changed the the information in my memory banks. It's changed. Um, I started uh, weighing myself, checking my weight, uh, and, and I forgot about it, and I sporadically do it, but the other day, the day after Christmas, I weighed myself, and then I happened to have this thing on my phone, my notes, where I've got each time I've weighed myself, and I've only weighed myself eight times since 2020. But what was disappointing was I'm 3.6 kilos heavier today than I was in 2020. And here I was thinking I was losing weight, but I'm, I'm putting it on. So change is a constant in life. We are always changing whether we realize it or not. Ever heard of the law of atrophy? That something's either going forward and growing or it's dying. Um, I, I, the last three weeks, I stopped going to the gym. You probably noticed the transformation in my body. Up until that, I was going onwards and upwards towards an Adonis-like figure. But the last three weeks, guess what? It hasn't stayed the same. The muscles are decreasing, and I'm going back to what I was. I wish this would go back to what it was in 2020, but it's not going back quite as fast as the muscles do. But the point is, change is a constant in life, and we cannot avoid change. So whether you like it or not, you are going to change in 2024. Amen. Whether you like it or not, whether you're planning for it, whether you think you will, you are going to change in 2024 because change is constant in life. You are going to change. Everybody say, I am going to change. Whether you like it or not, you are going to change. You are going to change. There are going to be situations outside of your control that will have a direct impact on your life. Who remembers, who remembers the C word from a few years ago? Remember COVID? All of a sudden, there was change forced upon us. We didn't choose that change, but all of a sudden, we started doing things differently, thinking differently, looking at things differently, and so on, not because of a a decision we made to change, but because all of a sudden, the world shut down, and you couldn't leave your house, and you couldn't go out with more than one person. You couldn't do, couldn't do, couldn't do, and all of a sudden, so many things changed, but that kind of change is the change that's forced upon us by external circumstances. The beautiful thing or the empowering thing about New Year's Eve or New Year's resolutions is it's a different kind of change. It's a change where we decide what kind of changes. We're we're in control of the changes that we want to make when we make and think about these things called New Year's resolutions. Now, here's a thought. What if this year, instead of thinking about the changes I want to make, 
i.e., I want to get fit. I want to eat healthier. I want to get rich. You know? I want to whatever. You can fill in the blank. Instead of making changes that I want to make, what if I think about the change that I need to make? What about instead of thinking about the change I want to make, and I actually sat back and said to God, God, what's the change? I've got all these things that I want to do, all these great ideas and change things that I'd like to put in place. But instead of pursuing and chasing after the change I want to make, because statistically 91% of them aren't going to happen anyway, what if I spent some time and I sat with you, God, and I opened myself up to the Spirit and said, God, oh, I, there's lots of change I want to make, but Lord, what's the change that you, God, who knows me, knows that I need to make? I need to make. It's not what I want, but God, you know me and you know my circumstances and my world and my life and you know that I need to. There's an imperative from heaven. I need to make this change. I need to make this change. How many of you right now, as soon as I said that, thought of an area of your life, an area that you know you need to change? You know. You know that you need to change this area of your life. Maybe you, maybe you thought you would change it in 2019 and it didn't work. So then maybe 2020 and then 2021 and 2022 and 2020 and it's never changed. And maybe you gave up on it. Maybe you let it go. Maybe you're walking in certain consequences now because you couldn't be bothered changing that. As I'm talking to you right now, are you thinking of something? What if we decided that in 2024 we would say no more to that part of our life? that we know is holding us back from being all God created us to be and doing all the things that God created us to do. That ungodly desire that's inside of you, that you know, you know there's this desire that you know God doesn't want and it's been there for year after year after year, but it's still there. And we're trying to change all these other things, but you know that I really need to get a grip on that. I need healing, wholeness, deliverance, freedom from that. I've got to get a hold of that because if I don't get a hold of that area of my life, who knows what the future's going to be like. That destructive habit that you have that you just keep repeating, that unredeemed character trait. Who hasn't got unredeemed character traits? Those things that, that cause people to pull back a little bit from you. Arrogance, pride, negativity. Criticism, what that, that, that thing that you know deep down inside, this thing's kind of holding me back a little bit from being all I'm meant to be and doing all that God wants me to do. That dysfunctional way of thinking, always putting myself down, always thinking I'm nothing, rejecting uh, 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 positive you know, comments from people and, and encouragements and so on. There's that, that character trait, that thing that goes on on the inside of us. Those automated Pavlovian dog type responses. Someone says something and bang, I jump on them. The unhealthy coping mechanisms. Nothing wrong with going home if you want to have a beer or a glass of wine at the end of work, but one turns into two, turns into three, turns into five, and before you know it, you can't cope without having something that kind of takes that edge off, levels you out. That thing in our lives that we know has the potential to, and most probably already is, sabotage the abundant life of God that he wants to flow through us. What are you thinking right now? Are you thinking something? Is there, is there a, an area of your world that you just know? If it's something that you find really, really hard to admit to somebody else, that's probably it. You find it really hard to admit it to yourself? That could be it. I don't know you and I'm not telling you what it is, but I believe the Holy Spirit knows what that thing is. And I believe 2024, instead of making changes I want to make, what if I put some time and energy into going, God, I'm going to make the change I need to make because that's going to have a way better impact on my future than just going to a gym three days a week. That's great. I've got no problem with the changes you want to make. The changes I want to make are great changes, but I know this. There are the changes I want to make that will benefit me, but there's a change that I need to make that the benefit will go way beyond just myself. And am I prepared to face the fact that there's some changes I need to make. And am I prepared to give the change I need to make priority over the change I want to make? What if we decided 2024 was going to be the year that we finally began to find freedom 
and deliverance, healing, restoration, redemption in that area of your life. What if we said that's what 2024 was going to be for me? That's my resolution. That's where I'm going. What if by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, we could finally put that area to death? Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be great to be able to finally put that thing in the grave where it belongs and walk in the new life that Christ offers us? Question, what is God saying to you? Where does he want you to change? Could be your health. Could be a marriage. Could be your finances. Could be some other area of relationship. Could be parenting. Could be something in the workspace of your life. Could be something in the play space of your life. Could be something in your career. Could be in your spiritual life. Where do you need to change? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? where you need to change. Now, I want you to do something. I want you now, picture how different your life could be in five to ten years if you make that change. Just for 20 seconds, close your eyes and think. What would the benefits be? How different could your life be in five to ten years if you wrestle that thing to the ground by the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God? What could your life look like in five to ten years? I'll make this promise to you. If this is the thing that's coming up to you that, you that you know you need to change, then I promise you in five to ten years, that picture is going to look a lot better than it does now. Now, just for ten seconds, picture your life in five to ten years if you don't make that change. If you don't grab a hold of it now and it continues to get a hold of you, what's your life look like in five years' time? It's probably not pretty because it's probably going to get stronger. It's probably going to get more dominant. And, you might, and depending on what that thing is, you may be able to hide it and mask it and cover it to a certain point, but at some point, it's going to pop its head up. At some point, it's, the cat's going to get out of the bag and it's going to go run right through your lounge room and tear everything up. That's what happens with these things. Galatians 6.1 Bear with me, I'm going to connect this. So you're going to look at it and go, tilt, tilt, what's that got to do with it? Galatians 6.1 says this. It says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, everyone say caught in a sin. Caught in a sin. It says, brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in a sin. Here's my question. Why wait to get caught? Why wait to get caught? Whatever that thing is in our life, why wait for the consequences of that to come to bear on us before we do anything about it? See, this is, how mo- this is how a lot of us operate. We wait till we feel the consequence of whatever the problem is, then we decide to do something about it. Because the consequences now hit me, I've now run into that brick wall, now it's like I'm forced to have to confront and I'm forced to have to do something about it. Why wait to be caught in your dysfunction, your sin, your weakness, whatever the thing is, why wait to be caught in it before you attempt to do something about it? So many people wait to make the changes they know they need to make in their lives until they're confronted with the consequences of not making the change sooner. Don't be the person that waits to be confronted with the consequence of not making the change, then decide to make the change, because it could be too late. Let me tell you this, God is a God of second chances. Who believes that? I believe that. Third chances, four chances, five chances, 20 chances, a thousand chances. But your boss might not be, because he's not God. Your wife or your husband might not be. They're not God. Your friends might not be. The bank might not be. They're not God. So why not make the changes that we know we need to make before we need to make them, not because we need to make them? Change before you have to, not because you have to. I think it was Jack Welch, the CEO of General Electric years ago, he coined this phrase, change before you have to. And the point he was making in the business sector was, uh, if you wait, if you get to the point where you change because you have to, you're already too far gone. Somebody's beat you to the punch and you're now chasing your industry. So don't change, don't change because you have to, change before you have to. 
Change before you have to. Don't wait to get caught. Don't wait to be found out. Don't wait to be behind the eight ball. Don't wait for the consequences to flare up in front of you, for the walls to come crashing down and everybody to know. Make the decision to change before you have to, not because you have to. And wouldn't it be great in 2024 if we had that attitude with that area of your life? I'm going to change before I have to. I'm not going to wait to change because I have to, because I may not get a second bite of the cherry. I may not get a second chance there. I may not. Now, I'd love to stand here as a Christian and go, oh, you always get second, you always get second chances from God. Yes, you do. But how many of you know that we're not surrounded by God down here? We're dealing with people in a very real world of broken and fallen humanity. And sometimes people don't give us second chances. Sometimes the consequences of the things that we do will last for a week, a day. Sometimes them consequences will go through till the day you leave here and stand before Jesus. And then you're free of the consequence. But the rest of your time down here, you might be carrying that scar around. So what if we changed before we had to instead of changing because we had to? Wouldn't that be better? Doesn't it make more sense to change before you have to when you know you've got to change instead of going, I know I've got to change, but I'll wait until I have to change. It's like driving your car down the highway and saying, I don't need to put fuel in. I'll wait until I have to put fuel in. Well, guess what? If you don't actually run out of fuel at a petrol station, you're in a world of hurt. You're in a world of hurt. Wouldn't it make more sense to pull in, get the fuel, do it before you got to, don't wait until you have to. It's a bad life strategy to spend your whole life changing because you have to. Why don't you use your intelligent brain that God gave you and the spirit that's in you and listen to God and go, God, what do, where do I need to change in my life now before I have to? Because changing before you have to is way better than changing because you have to. 1 Peter 5.8 says this about the devil, the enemy of your soul. It says this, it says, Be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He prowls about like a roaring lion looking for someone to take down. Looking for someone to, in the words of Jesus, steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he does. God has a wonderful, beautiful plan for your life. The devil also has a plan for your life. God wants you thriving and God wants you going from glory to glory and faith to faith and onwards and upwards. The devil wants to bring you down and he walks around trying to set traps for you to see if he can capture you in that area where you know you probably need to change. So change before you have to, not because you have to. Why wait to change because you have to when you can choose to change before you have to? Why not be honest with ourselves, with our vulnerabilities, our weaknesses, disappointments, pains, hurts, whatever it is, why don't we be transparent and honest with ourselves about them and bring them to God before you have to. In an interesting, it's amazing how many people come to God because they have to. You ever notice that? We, 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 we don't, you know, prayer's not that important. I don't get in the face of God. I'm not too worried about my spiritual life. Then something happens in my life and all of a sudden, now I'm running to God and it's right that you do that. I'm saying it's a good thing. But so many people only go to God because they have to, instead of before they have to. We wait till we crash and burn. We wait till something bad happens. We wait till we're in dire straits. Then we go to the lover of our souls, and God is gracious and merciful, and he reaches down and he picks us up and he loves us. But he wants more than just us going to him because we have to. He wants us to come to him before we have to. Because maybe if we go to him before we have to, maybe we don't get to the point where we come to him because we have to. And it's a better relationship, I think, going to a person because uh, before I have to as opposed to constantly going because I have to all the time. Change before you have to. Or you'll end up having to change because you have to. And don't think that we automatically get second bites of the cherry. We sometimes don't. Did you ever know someone who changed because they had to? But they should have changed before they had to. And as a result, it cost them a lot. My, 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 my dad gave up smoking. Uh, I remember I was about 20, 21 years of age. I was in Youth with the Mission. I got a phone call from my dad. My dad's a pretty, he was always a pretty strong, big, solid sort of guy, but he smoked his whole life, as long as I knew him. He smoked, and, and um, if you're a smoker, I got, and I'm not having a go at, at whatever. What I'm saying is this, that, that he knew that the, the health uh, 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 negatives of that, he knew all that stuff, all the information was there. He knew all that stuff. And he wanted to give up, but he just couldn't. It was just too hard and just didn't so on. One day he rings me up and he goes, Alan, uh, and he's, he's teary on the phone saying, I've got to go to, to uh, Brisbane Hospital and I've got to get a stent put in. I've had a heart attack. 
So I drove down to the hospital to be with him and I watched my dad, this big burly man, go off into the surgery thinking, we, you know, I, I, I don't know anything about this. It's the first time this has happened in my world. I hope he comes out and he's hoping he comes out and so on. Now, praise God, my dad is alive today. And he, but the thing is this, once he got out of that surgery, he never put another cigarette in his mouth. He started eating healthy. All these changes that he knew he needed to make, but he didn't want to make. He had a heart attack, and then he made changes not before he had to. He made all these changes because he had to. And praise God, he got a second chance. But how many of you know a lot of people don't get that second chance, do they? I've got a friend of mine, and uh, two years ago, I've known him for years. Me and Jackie have known him for a long, long time. And he's a great guy, great guy, great in his community, great with, with, with friends, great in all these areas. But the one thing he did is he neglected his wife. He just neglected his wife. She was a, a lovely lady. And we would, we would go around. Sometimes it would be awkward. We'd be there having dinner with him. And, and then she would, you know, she'd have a couple of glasses of wine and bang, it would all come out. And we're kind of like, Ooh, what do you do? He's there, she's there. And, but you're there. And we've walked with these guys. They're not believers. Anyway, years and years of neglect. And one day, she turns around and says to him, I'm out of here. I'm gone. I'm out. And he's a good guy. He's not a bad guy. But year after year after year, I've just neglect doing what he wanted, not caring about her. And then all of a sudden, he says to her, don't go, let's go and get some counselling, I'll go and get counselling. She said to him, it's too late. You've known this has been here for years. This problem has been around for years. And she left him. And he didn't get a second bite of the cherry in that situation. To this day, they're separated. And that's had massive consequences on both their lives. But he didn't get a second chance. He didn't change before he had to. He wanted to change because he had to, but guess what? It was too late in his situation. The damage had been done, and she'd left him. How many great men and women of God have we read about and heard about that have fallen before the consequences of sin and weakness? These issues didn't just pop up overnight. These things have been there for a long, long time, and they should have dealt with them before they had to. Instead, they had to deal with them because they had to, because the whole world found out about it because they lost their church, because they lost their ministry, because they lose their platform, because somebody put it on Twitter or whatever it is. How many men and women of God have we read about in, in, in church in your lifetime alone who should have changed before they had to, but they didn't, and ended up having to change because they had to, because they lost everything. They lost everything. These things don't just pop up overnight, people. We know they're in there, don't we? If we're brutally honest with ourselves, we know there's stuff about my character there's, there's, there's maybe habits I have behind closed doors. There's ways I think. There are things that I know are holding me back and hindering me from being everything God wants me to be. Not just inside, but doing everything that God wants me to do. And I know it's there. And year after year after year, I tolerate it and I put up with it. And I want to change this, 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 all this other stuff. But this one thing here has the potential to sidetrack you and take you down. And if we don't deal with it, we, we, we had this intruder in our house this week. Yeah, had an intruder in our house. We knew that because our fruit bowl had these little bites out of the bananas. <laughs> Telling you, don't break into my fruit bowl, baby. It's not a safe place. I'm very defensive of my fruit bowl. So we woke up and there's these bite marks out of the fruit bowl. And so you know what? It happened one night and a couple of nights. It happened a few times. So we got this uh, trap thing that we, we set and so on and we, you know... Anyway, this morning we come out and, and uh, Jackie goes out to make coffee, comes running back in and goes, we got it, we got it, it's in the thing, yes! And I picked that thing up. I can't tell you what it is because some people might love them. It was a rat. So I picked that thing up and just a tail hanging out the back, put it in the bin. We won, yes. But while I'm walking out to the bin, I thought about what I was going to preach today and that poor little rat. And I thought, man, if you had to dealt with this issue before today... <laughs> You might not be where you are right now. He says, there's no coming back from, from this one. You're dead. <laughs> there ain't no second chance here, you see. If you had just dealt with your banana fetish, maybe you'd be free today. But you didn't change before you had to. And so guess what? You changed because you had to. And you're dead. Hebrews 12.1 says this. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, now listen to this, let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles. Who's throwing it off? He's speaking to believers here. He's saying, who's throwing it off? We are. In other words, we're participating in this process, aren't we? There's a sense of participation in this. Let us throw off 
everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And that thing that you need to change, maybe it's a sin. Maybe it's just a thing that hinders. Something, whatever it is, the two common things about the sin and the entanglements here, the stuff that's slowing people down, the common thing here is the result of both of them is it's slowing you down from running the race you're meant to run. It's holding the person back. It's holding them back from running the race. See, God has a great race for each of us to run. It's a great life. Jesus called it an abundant life. But we don't just get there because God wants us to. We have to play our role. We throw off things that hinder and we deal with sin that entangles. That's what we do. We participate in our own freedom. We participate in our own future. What is that thing that you need to change? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? Do it before you have to, not because you have to. How many husbands and wives lose their spouses and then agree to counselling? Or then agree to spend more time with their families. Or then agree to show more love for their husband or their wife. Or then agree to work less hours and prioritize. How many people do it after the fact? How many people have a health crisis and then agree to start to exercise? And then they change their diet. And then they they start prioritizing sleep and rest. And then they cut out the drinking. And then they give up the drugs. They wait and then. How many people end up in dire straits financially? And then. They decide to get a work ethic. Then they decide to start to turn up on time at the job they have. Then they decide to start working hard. Then they decide to pull their weight at the job site or to contribute to the team. Then they decide it's time to live within financial means and have a budget. And then, instead of before, change before you have to, people, not because you have to. How many people all but lose their love and passion for Jesus and then they decide to join a faith community? And then they decide to read their Bible. And then they decide to get a prayer life or start actually living out the things that Jesus taught in their day-to-day lives. And then they start to deal with the old man and all the sinful desires that are being kept alive through constantly feeding them in the way that we live and the things that we watch and the things that we listen to, the places that we go. If you wait to change because you have to, there's no guarantee of a second chance. My dad got one with his health, but my friend didn't get one with his marriage. So why take the risk? Why not make the decision that you're going to change before you have to instead of because you have to? I'll give you one biblical example of what I'm talking about and we'll finish with this. There's a guy in the Bible called Judas. Anyone know him? Yeah, doesn't get a great rap. Did some bad things. Judas had an area of weakness or temptation or brokenness. Call it what you want in his life. And it had a grip on him. And he needed to change, but he didn't. We don't know how it got there, but we see the end result of it. In John 12, verse 4 to 6, a woman has come and broken a nice bit of bottle of perfume and poured that perfume, expensive perfume, all over Jesus. And it says in, in, in John 12, verse 4 to 6, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Sounds like he's being financially frugal and fiscal, doesn't it? All the accountants went, amen. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and keeper of the money bag. He used to help himself to what was put in it. Judas had a problem. He had a problem. He used to steal. People used to come on into Arise Church when Judas was here. They used to put their money in that, that box up the back where our tithes and offerings go. People used to put it in there, and when you went out for coffee, Judas would open the back of it and take money out. One for you, two for me. One for you, two for me. He had a problem. Some people get to take their secrets to the grave, but Judas didn't. Somehow we found out about this. We know that Judas was a thief. The truth is, somebody probably knows about that area you need to change too. We're sitting here thinking only we know about it. Here's the reality. I bet you there are people around you. I know that because the area you need to change impacts more than just yourself. It has an impact on the people around you, the people closest to you. At the very least, God knows about it. Matthew 27, verse 3. Watch this. It says, When Judas, who'd betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. Judas chose to change, but he chose to change because he had to, not before he had to. 
And guess what? It didn't work out for him. It was too late. It appears that the damage had been done. There was no coming back. Maybe the shame or the regret were too much for him to come back from, we don't know. But here's a classic example of a man who would have walked in with Jesus three years. I've got no doubt. You, you hearing Jesus teach, you being around that group of people, at some point the Holy Spirit would have been going, hey, Judas, you've got to get a grip on this. What's going on, son? Let's work on this. Let's break the back of this thing. Let's get free of this thing. Because if you don't get free of this thing, one day it's going to take you out. And how many men and women of God have been taken out? And here's the thing. I don't care whether you have a, a million people following you on Twitter or an internet profile or you have a mega church. It doesn't matter. If you get taken out by the enemy, you're taken out by the enemy no matter how big and no matter how many people know about it. No matter how many people know about it. Sometimes we look at these guys on TV and these celebrities and we go, oh, we're so judgmental and critical of them because they didn't deal with that thing when they were that big. Wait until they were that big. The devil sets a trap and bang, down they come. And lots of people are hurt by it. I don't care whether you're that big or this big. It doesn't matter. The principle is the same. Change before you have to, people. What if, year, what if 2024 was the year we said no more to that area of our life? No more to that thing. Don't wait for the damage to be done. Don't wait to be confronted with consequence. Let's make the decision to change before we have to. I hope that makes sense to you because it makes a lot of sense to me. Here's what I want to do. Christy, where's Christy here? Where's Christy? Do you want to jump up on the, on the keyboard for me? We're about to finish up. Is that okay? Christy didn't even know. This is how good she is. She just jumps up and magic spirit fingers will go to work. You watch. You watch. Here's what I want to do. I just want us to take five minutes. Three to five minutes. And I want you to think about that thing. What's that area where you know you need to change? Nobody else needs to know about it. You know about it and God knows about it. And what I want you to do is this. I want you to come on up. If that doesn't work, you can jump on guitar if you want. Yeah. I've got notepads there and there's some pens and envelopes. Here's what I want you to do. Because I know, I know how this works. I sit through these sorts of things too. You know, I, I listen to sermons and that as well and go to conferences. And I know how it works. Spirit can really be speaking and moving. You can be going, yeah, yeah, I get it. I'm making connections here. But then we go out there and we have a bad cheeseburger and all of a sudden we're angry at McDonald's and we forget about all the other stuff and we move on in life to the next thing. Just as an act of faith, this is what I, I, I want you to do. If that's you and you know that God is speaking to you about an area of your world, you don't need to publicize it or tell anybody. It doesn't matter. What I want you to do is I want you to come on up here. I want you to grab a bit of paper. I don't care if you go back to your seat and, 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 and you grab a pencil and you write it. I don't care if you stay up here and write it. I don't really care. I just want you to fill out that bit of paper. I want you to put it in an envelope there. Seal the envelope. Write your name on it because you're going to get it back in four weeks. And I promise you, I promise you, confidentiality, nobody is going to look at any of these. Nobody's going to look at any of them. But by getting up and writing it down, it's almost like you making yourself accountable before God. Saying, you know what, God, I'm, this is my way of letting you know I, I'm hearing you, God. I'm actually hearing you. Yep. I'm hearing you and you're right. If I don't get a grip on this, if I don't change this area that I need to change, then God, I know that the only person to blame down the track will be me because I didn't listen to you, Lord. I didn't want to do the hard work. And over the next three weeks, I'm just going to talk about different little aspects of how we begin to outwork this and things that I think will help us on that journey to becoming free and delivered of this particular area or thing, whatever it is in your life. So while these guys are playing, if you feel like God's been speaking to you, just as a simple act of faith, I want to encourage you. Come on up, grab a bit of paper. Don't, wait, don't have to wait till I'm finished talking. Write it down, put it in that envelope. Just leave the envelope there. I promise you confidentiality. And I also promise you this, that people for the next four weeks are going to be coming into this place and they're going to be praying over that. So this is not, these, are not, these areas are not areas that we change just because New Year's Eve is not just about willpower. It is for the world out there, just willpower. We can do this all ourselves. Let me tell you something. If you could change that area you need to change within your own strength, I know this about you. You're good people. You would have done it by now. But you can't. You can't. So we're going to do an experiment for the first four weeks of 2024. We're going to take a step of faith. We're going to trust God. We're going to believe God together for victory for all of us in this room. Amen.
Why don't you come down? If that's you, come down. You can write it here. You can. I don't care what you do. Take it back to your seat. I don't care. Write it down. Put it in the envelope. These guys are just going to play for a few minutes and then I'm going to close in prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And if you're sitting there thinking, I don't want to get up because people will know I've got stuff. Hey, everyone knows you've got stuff anyway, people. Okay? I'm going to be writing something down on there. Put your name on the envelope so we can make sure we give you back your envelope. <laughs> yeah, Rod, Rod just said he's going to write mine down for me. something about faith steps we're going to change before we have to not because we have to we're going to take that first step we're going to take that invitation from God 2024, that's enough. We're going to break the back of that thing. We're going to do everything we can by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to see freedom, deliverance, wholeness. Habits are going to be broken. Thought patterns are going to change. Marriages strengthened. People set free. Because we're not doing it in our own willpower. Because we can't. If we could, we would have done it by now. So we're bringing God in. We're stepping out in faith. We're believing in the power of prayer. For the next four weeks, every single day, someone's going to be praying over this for you. We're going to be praying for each other. We're enacting the power of community when a community prays together. You know, Arise Church started pretty much in the early days. We prayed every Tuesday night. We used to meet out at the Tillman's house and every Tuesday night was a prayer meeting. And that's kind of how the, the DNA of where we got to where we got to was prayer. Prayer for one another, praying for each other, standing with each other, believing for each other. We want to see that again. It says something about one putting a thousand to flight, but two putting ten thousand to flight. Something about being yoked together, carrying one another's burdens, all that kind of stuff that empowers us. God is good. Jesus said, I came to give you an abundant kind of life. It says, Paul petitioned the Lord for this thorn in his flesh. We don't know what it is. Different theologians have theories. He says, I petitioned the Lord three times and eventually God spoke and he said, my grace is sufficient. Well, I can tell you now that area I need to change. I haven't heard God say my grace is sufficient yet. So I'm still believing for change, transformation, freedom, healing, wholeness, whatever. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Once again, I promise you we are committed to confidentiality. They're going straight in a, a, a box or something lockable. Nobody is going to see them. And you're going to get them back in four weeks' time. I'm excited. I'm excited about 2024. I think it's going to be a great year. I'm excited to stir myself up again in faith I'm excited to continue this journey of going well God if you really are who you say you are and I'm betting my life on this as most of you in this room are 
Then as Jackie said, I want to dive all in. Some of us have been standing with our toes in the water long enough. You know the water's good. Get in, get in up to your ankles. Some of you have been standing there up to your knees and you know the water's good. You know it's safe. Well, get in up to your waist. Some of us have been standing there in shoulder deep water. And God's proven himself. We know he has. It's time to get your head wet. Swim out in the deep water. Be with him. Trust him. Take him at his word. Because he's a good God. He's a good God. When these last guys are finished, if there's anybody else, anyone else sitting there and you feel like you should bring something to God, this is between you and God. Like I said, it's your way of saying to God, you've got my attention, Lord. You know, how many of you, how many of you know you can sit there and pretend not to, that God hasn't got your attention? Ever, ever done that? We, me and Jackie went um, to Bel, uh, Evan's head yesterday and we were walking along the wall and there was a gentleman, as we were walking towards him, he's doing this, waving at his daughter and she was just over that way, little, little girl, about so big. As we got closer to him, he's waving like this and he, he knew that he looked like, okay, what are you doing? And so he stopped and looked at us and he goes, that's my daughter right there. He said, I know she can see me, but she's pretending she can't. Your father knows, doesn't he? He knows when he's got your attention. He also knows when you're ignoring him. How much more our Heavenly Father? Okay, we're going to finish up. Before we do, I want everybody to stand and reach your hand out towards that pile of envelopes. We're going to start by praying together. We're going to start by believing together. You're believing for yourself. You're believing for your neighbor. You're believing for the person to the left and the right, the chair in front, the chair behind. We believe in God. And mark this day, people. What I'm telling you today is we're doing this by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. This is not a willpower thing. You have to include God in the process. You have to include God in the process. And as people are praying, I want you to pray each day over this area. I want you to bring it before the Lord and we say, God, thank you. Lord, thank you. Thank you for freedom and deliverance, God. Speak to me, Father. 2024, I'm going to say no more to that thing. It's not going to take me out. It's not going to destroy my marriage. It's not going to kill my career. It's not going to ruin my reputation. It's not going to disqualify me from ministry. It's not going to do whatever it is because I'm dealing with it before I have to, not because I have to. So, Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for every, uh, uh, God, every envelope there represents something that somebody knows they need to deal with, God. Father, these are not New Year's resolutions. These are not things that we want. God, these are things that we know we need. And so, Father, we as a community are going to, God, we agree together. God, we agree together for every single thing that's written on those pages. God, every area of deliverance, of freedom, of healing, of wholeness, of transformation, of change, God, we believe together we combine our faith and we say, Holy Spirit, Move in the lives of these people. Set them free. Deliver them. Open prison doors. Lord, we declare 2024, no more will these things hold people back. No more will these things dictate and dominate and control the lives of your people, God. We break the power of these things, Father. And we pray for each person. Holy Spirit, would you take them on a journey? Take them on a journey. Would you, inside their heart, Father, I pray, would you give them faith to believe that something happened this morning, God, when they stood up in faith and wrote that down, God, that was their way of saying, you got my attention, Lord. And I pray, Father, over the next four weeks that they would continue, you would continue to have their attention as we break the back of some of these things by the power of God, by the grace of God, because you love your children and you want to give us life. And freedom, Father. And some of this stuff has held people back for way, way too long. God, some of the things in those envelopes, God, people, have, people feel like maybe it's not holding them back, but they know somewhere down the track it's going to kill them. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And Father, we stand here together this afternoon and we just thank you for the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for that moment in time 2,000 years ago where something spiritually happened, something as real as what happened in the natural. As Jesus' body breathed its last breath in the natural, 
the temple veil was torn in half. And we were given access to the very creator himself. The Holy Spirit was released upon your people. Each person here, Lord, filled with the Spirit. So, Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, God. And, Father, we look forward in faith to what you're going to say, what you're going to show us, what you're going to do in and through us as we go on this little journey over the next four weeks and beyond. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. 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 Awesome. Awesome. Bless you guys.